As I thought about what I might say today, I was encouraged by Kathy to go back to a talk which I gave 22 years ago in 1990. The talk was titled, The New Global Economy, Is the U.S. Ready? The New Global Economy, Is the U.S. Ready? And I was speaking to a group of economists who were here in the city in 1990. Why go back 22 years, you might ask? Because of the focus of that talk, which was the education of our youth and our assessment of how we stood in our readiness to compete in the global world. These remain as relevant today, obviously, as they ever have been, and they remain core to the work of GCF. I'll begin with the bad news. The response I offered 22 years ago is the same as what I say to you today. No, the United States is not ready, is not ready to compete in the new global economy. Why? Because we are not acting on the fundamental truth that the future of our country is almost entirely dependent on our youth, how they develop and how they grow. We know that's true, but we are not acting on that truth. The plain fact is that today we are failing to give not 10%, not 20%, but 30 to 40% of our youth the preparation they need to succeed. We are failing. Far too many of our youth are growing up with huge educational deficits compared to other nations and in the absolute. We're hearing talk of many deficits on the political campaign. We're hearing about trade deficits, budget deficits, job deficits. But make no mistake, you all know this. It is the deficit in the education of our youth that is the key to fixing every one of those other deficits. We all know it. The future belongs to the educated. When I was a kid, parents might tell their children, if you don't seize the opportunity for a good education, it's going to be your tough luck. And it was their tough luck. But today, it's everyone's tough luck. And it's going to be far more so in the future. It's a future that other strong nations see the same way. Young men and women from other parts of the globe are moving ahead. And ladies and gentlemen, with all our effort, we are not, at least not in a sufficient way. Historically, I think we sometimes forget that our nation was an economic leader, importantly, because our young people were better prepared. If you go back to 1955, the United States was enrolling 80% of all the kids, 15 to 19 year olds, in school full time while in Europe, that same number was 10 to 20%. Today, we still have a dropout rate of 25%. You know what it was when I talked in 1990? The same. Tragically, the number has not gone down. Test after test shows that our students' academic proficiency is well below the proficiency of many other nations. We know the numbers. We're in the middle of the pack. The education gap which exists in our country today is crippling. You might have seen the article in the Wall Street Journal last week. Brad Smith, Executive Vice President of Microsoft, wrote that Microsoft right now has 6,000 open jobs, 15% more than they had a year ago. And more than half of them are for, as you might expect, engineers, software developers, computer specialists. That same picture is going on across the nation. The prediction is there will be 120,000 jobs of that kind needed each year going forward, and yet only 40,000 students are being graduated to fill such jobs. Proof, if any were needed, that there are not enough young Americans that have the talents needed to compete in today's economy, and you know what? If those jobs aren't filled here, you know where they'll be filled? You know. Little could one have imagined back in 1990 what would be happening in the global scene. Well, I could see, we could all see that China was opening up, that Eastern Europe was opening up, but few could have envisaged, I think, how fast globalization and technology would proceed. I mean, the way to look at it today, as I see it, is that there are hundreds of millions of jobs that are being competed for around the world, which then were really reserved for U.S. citizens because of the closed economy in which we lived. This is not being adequately recognized in the political discourse that we hear today. Thinking about what we might not have imagined in 1990, even less could have we envisaged the huge investments that other countries are making in their children. I'd offer these statistical comparisons, recently quoted in the New York Times between China and the United States. 
Half of U.S. children get no, get no early childhood education. And to the best of my knowledge, we have no national strategy for really changing that. In contrast, by 2020, China has committed to provide 70% of the, all the children in China with not one, not two, but three years of pre-K education. Consider this, only about half of all the graduates of high school go on to post-secondary education in this country, and half of them drop out. So you're down to about a quarter. By 2020, China is committing to more than doubling enrollment in higher education, doubling enrollment by 2020, and they're committed to ensuring that no child drops out because of lack of money. By 2030, it's estimated that China will have 200 million college graduates. That's more than the entire workforce of the United States. Well, now going back to 1990 in that talk, I emphasized the strengths we have as a nation, which we all know and which are very, very rich. Our innovative capacity, our individual initiative, our access to capital, our rule of law that prevails, and our diversity, which I would underscore. A diversity which I believe has been the glue which has enabled us to adapt to different cultures, probably than the companies of any other country. And these strengths have been evident as firms like P&G, like Microsoft, like Google, and others have been able to build leading businesses around the world. And yet, as I said then, can we really expect to remain the leading country economically and socially a nation of opportunity for all, not just 30 to 40 percent of the young people growing up in the circumstances which our children are growing up in. If we're less prepared, if our children are less prepared than their counterparts from other nations, of course we can't. This, ladies and gentlemen, on a very serious note, I believe is our Achilles heel. While our accumulated technology and the values we possess as a people will remain and I think will attenuate decline. I am convinced that this decline will occur slowly, but inevitably, unless we dramatically, dramatically strengthen the education of our youth, all of our youth, starting in their very earliest years. All right, uh, by now some of you out there might be thinking, I get it. We're in trouble. I've heard enough statistics. Please remember, we came here for a celebratory meal do you have anything at all positive to say? <laughs> and yes, I do. I say it with some sense of caution, frankly, because I know how much there is to do. But I also say it with a sense of confidence that what I want to say here is real. And it's this. We have proven programs in our community to help families and their children like we have never had. And I've been looking at the subject pretty carefully. And we have programs that very few communities in this nation have, as we do today. If we rally behind these initiatives persistently, like we really mean it, with our volunteer time and, yes, more funding, we can, and I believe we will, make breakthrough progress. Allow me to briefly describe four of these programs. I'm pleased to say that GCF has been there in the leadership and the funding of every one of them. The first is Every Child Succeeds, led by my dear friend, Judy Van Ginkle. Partnering with Children's Hospital, and now in its 13th year, ECF serves 3,000 first-time at-risk moms and their families annually, through professional home visitors and through community support. All these families live below the poverty line. Many of them live within three miles of where we're having this wonderful lunch. This program has dramatically increased average birth weight. It has cut infant mortality by more than half, and it's put 90% of these babies on a normal development path. Maternal depression has been cut in half, and the number and percentage of the moms who are getting GEDs and in securing employment has just soared. Yet, a paltry 25%, a paltry 25% of all the families that we know would benefit from this in our community are receiving it. And I hate to tell you that number has declined by 10% over the last two years because of a reduction in state funding that has not been fully compensated by the heroic efforts of your United Way to cover the gap. Do you know what it costs to cover 
one family like this for one year, it's $2,800. Is it worth $2,800 to change a parent and a child's life forever? I'm sure you'd agree it is. And so did a woman at Procter & Gamble, who I described this program to a month or so ago as I was talking about United Way. And she came up at the end, and she said she was going to increase her gift to the United Way this year by $2,800 in order to cover one more family. Did I ever give her a hug? The second program I want to talk about is Success by Six. Now in its 10 year, 10th year, led by Stephanie Bird, who's right here, shared brilliantly by Jim Zimmerman, Success by Six focuses on delivering high quality pre-K education to children with a focus, as you'd expect, on having them ready uh, to go in to kindergarten. As I thought about this in the past, and I think about it today, can you imagine what it would be like going into kindergarten as a young child and discovering you're unable to read where the kids around you can? How would you make you feel? Could you think of a better invitation to opt out right there at that early stage? That, sadly, is what happens. But well, Success by Six has, in a short space of five years, increased the percentage of children ready to enter pre-K from 44% to 57% in Cincinnati Public Schools. 44% to 57%. You'd look at those numbers and you'd say, this program is working. We should take it further. Still, we're well short of the goal of 85%, which the United Way has set by 2020. Helping to do this, and I invite your attention to this, is a new campaign called Read On. Read On. The goal is simple, to ensure that every single child is reading on grade by the end of the third grade. Why is that important? It's indisputable. If a child is not reading at grade level by the end of the third grade, that child is four times more likely to drop out than one that is. But if you add to that a circumstance where the child is growing up in poverty and is growing up in an impoverished neighborhood, the chances of that child growing up, of dropping out before they're through is 17 times higher than a child from those same circumstances who's been taught to read by the, the end of the third grade. Greg Landsman said it well. We can begin to break the cycle of poverty by getting a child prepared for kindergarten. We all but break that cycle if that child is reading successfully by the end of the third grade. The statistics are that compelling. It is that simple. Teachers can't achieve this goal on their own. Volunteer tutors are crucial, and the city and community are doing great work on this right now. The Strive Partnership, Cincinnati Public Schools, and the United Way have teamed up in the last two months to recruit 1,000 new tutors. So far, they've recruited 500. Over 26 CEOs in our community have stepped up to have their organizations participate in this tutoring program. Trust me, tutoring is not hard to do. Many of you have done it. The schedules are flexible. The training is quick. You're going to find information in the material that's at, at your table on how you can contact someone if you'd be willing to be a tutor. The fourth program I want to say a word about is the Cincinnati Youth Collaborative and Jobs for Cincinnati Graduates, two organizations which have recently merged. Their mentoring, their tutoring, their college access programs, their job placement programs are reaching over 3,000 students per year. 3,000 students per year. And the graduates' ration rate for both these programs is 95%. That compares to an average graduation rate of about 50 or 55 percent. This makes a difference. Individual lives are being changed forever. Still, we need more volunteers, and yes, we need more funding. Mary Ronan, superintendent, as you know, of CPS, has told me we clearly need about 500 more spots in jobs for Cincinnati graduates. What will that cost? What does it cost per student? $1,000. $1,000 to change a student's life forever. How could you help make that happen? Well, by giving a little extra to the United Way campaign, which happens to end on Friday, and they are very, very close to making or surpassing the goal. So it's not too late to give, but probably every one of you have given, but maybe to give a little bit more. Well, the hour is getting late, uh, but there is one more initiative that I want to mention, and that is the Strive Partnership. 
It is the most promising organizational catalyst that I have seen since I began work in this area in the mid-1980s. Led by Greg, Greg Landsman and chaired by Kathy Merchant, it brings together people in support from prenatal to postgraduate education, cradle to career, to invest their collective time, their funds, their talent on what works to the end of, for the first time, to my knowledge, anywhere, having a continuum of support that's needed from the beginning all the way through college and after college. The STRIVE partnership focuses on the most important outcomes, such as kindergarten readiness, student proficiency, training principals and teachers, and locating community support directly in the schools. It unites early intervention programs, like Every Child Succeeds and Success by Six, with the K-12 curriculum, avoiding the siloism that is perpetuated in this whole arena. Folks, these and other programs are working, but we need to scale them. To do that, we need more volunteers, and yes, we need more money, and we need it at the public level, and we need it at the volunteer level. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here is the bottom line, and you know it as well as I do. Providing the support for all of our children to grow up, to be successful, is the social justice and the moral issue of our time. But it's not only the social justice and moral issue of our time, it is also the economic issue of our time. We've all seen the ads and we've heard the campaign slogans until we're blue in the face. Jobs, jobs, jobs. That mantra won't get it done. What will get it done is a concerted, continuing effort in providing the childhood education that's needed from the beginning and not stopping there and continuing on. David Kearns of Xerox once said, we cannot have a world-class economy without a world-class workforce. And we cannot have a world-class workforce without having world-class preparation for our youth. He was right. Again, it is that simple. That is the truth. The world is on the move. We've got to act. The shocking shame, the shocking shame and cost of poor preparation of so many of our youth is clear, yes, in our inability to fill open jobs, but even more, it's evident in wasted lives. The only way our nation is going to maintain its leadership is by dramatically improving the preparation of all our youth. I'll conclude my remarks, other than a personal observation I want to make at the very end, by raising the same question I did 22 years ago of that audience. Do we in our community have the wisdom, do we have the will, and do we have the stamina to act on what we really do know to be true? It's not like we have to discover the truth here. Will we change our expectations and will we fuel the effort so that we don't just have 60 or 70 percent of our young people growing up as they are to be fully productive men and women but virtually 100%. Do we have that will? Because it won't be easy. And we're all going to have to be on board. This is our task, I submit. This is our opportunity. We can do this. We must do this. We've got better programs than we've ever had before. That doesn't mean they can't be improved, but they are good programs. And we're integrating them in a way we never did before, through Strive. Most of all, we have seen again and again that children have the God-given potential to succeed if given the chance, we've got the opportunity and I submit the responsibility to help them achieve that potential. We owe that to them and we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children and to our grandchildren. Failure is not an option, I submit to you. Our economy and our very way of life as a nation depends on it. Please take up the cause. Please don't let go of it. Do what you can to ensure that 22 years from now, if somebody is on a stage in front of this group, they will be able to be say that we made good, not perfectly, but in substantial measure on what is indeed the social and moral cause of our time and the economic issue of our time. Thank you for hearing that. I do want to close by going back to the beginning and by telling you that I would not be involved in any of these things if it were not for Francie. And in fact, these things I've been involved in, these wonderful undertakings with Judy, Every Child Succeeds, and mentoring with, with Jane, all of them were introduced to me by, by, by Francie. It was her getting me to finally read the book, The Brain, by Ron Kodalak on the third or fourth urging. 
and it was her telling me the story about her own mentee that, uh, and that led me to think and know that this is a very good thing. So I'm a real lucky guy. So let me finally thank you once again for this great honor, and giving me the opportunity to talk with you today.